Welcome back from the break. So, just to get things off my chest, so I've, I'm going to attempt to use uh, a tablet. So this is uh, an experiment in handwritten slides. Although, unlike Adam's talk, I do have slides. There will just be some choice moments where I do things by hand. And if my handwriting is like becoming illegible at some point, please let me know and I will try to do better. Um, so that caveat out of the way. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, is tracing attacks. And you can, um, you can sort of think of tracing attacks as a theoretical version of the membership inference attacks that Vitaly talked about. So remember from yesterday, you know, Vitaly sort of gave this, this uh, you know, nice sort of series of talks about sort of what is a meaningful membership inference attack and what is sort of not a meaningful membership inference attack. And, you know, he sort of showed this like, you know, wonderfully successful membership inference attack in the kind of deep learning oracle model. And you can sort of think about today's talk as sort of an investigation of membership inference in the plane model where we can hope to sort of, uh, you know, prove, prove that it works. And of course, you know, a sort of secondary motivation is to, to get to sort of lower bounds. But one thing that's kind of nice about giving this talk, you know, at this point is in the series is that you kind of already have seen that this stuff can be used like very effectively to uh, sort of expose privacy violations uh, in practice. And, and you know, we're going to talk about sort of when, it, when we can prove it works and what are sort of the issues that come up and, and sort of the key analytic features and also about sort of extensions to proving lower bounds uh, in privacy. But, you know, you can, how do I make this thing go? You can sort of, you know, I'm sort of happy to be the horse pulled by Vitaly's cart from yesterday. This is, but this is Vitaly. It's hard to tell because he had more hair. Yes. Wow, okay. Getting this thing to advance is like non-trivial. Oh, okay, so this is sort of captures some of the things that I, I said before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of present kind of these settings of, uh, you know, types of information you can release on a data set where uh, we can sort of prove that membership inference works and we can say sort of very cleanly like kind of how to analyze it. And in particular, kind of what I'm going to talk about in sort of the first big chunk of the, the talk is uh, you can think of a sort of a formalization of uh, a very influential uh, membership inference attack by Homer et al. Uh, I believe this was like mentioned briefly in Vitaly's talk, although not in like a substantive way, but roughly speaking, uh, what they did is they looked at some sort of publicly available genomic data sets. Um, and uh, so they looked at some sort of publicly available genomic data sets and showed that kind of given, you know, some information about you, they could sort of infer membership in the data set, uh, uh, membership in the data set, which of course in these genomic data sets often had like, you know, sort of membership in the data set conveyed like a lot of sort of sensitive medical information on its own uh, because these were data sets that corresponded to, you know, studies on, on people suffering from various illnesses. And uh, in sort of the second part of the talk, what I'm going to talk about are what I call robust tracing attacks. And all that really means is sort of how do these tracing attacks work in a setting where you add uh, a large amount of noise. So you, you, you've, you know, instead of just releasing some statistics and sort of hoping they're private, you have made some effort to make them private by adding, you know, some sort of noise. And uh, this is important, of course, you know, in, in, in reality, I mean, you'd want to determine sort of how hard it is to prevent membership inference. Uh, like, you know, you want to know how much noise has to be added to prevent membership inference attacks. Um, but also this, this noisy case is sort of very useful for giving kind of tight lower bounds on differential privacy in a lot of settings where, um, 
you know, reconstruction attacks, for instance, don't apply. So, so we saw reconstruction attacks, which, uh, as I said, are sort of not suitable for giving tight lower bounds in a lot of cases, and we'll see sort of why they're not suitable. Um, and we, you know, and, and we also saw sort of packing arguments, which are kind of these very nice, clean lower bounds for epsilon zero privacy, but don't really imply much for um, epsilon delta in particular because they're not sort of these like meaningful attacks. They're just sort of information theoretic arguments. So, so we'll see as kind of a consequence of these robust tracing attacks, kind of a tight lower bound on this problem of releasing the mean of a high dimensional data set. Uh, and I'll also mention some sort of connections to other problems like sort of selecting relevant features of your data, uh, sort of convex empirical risk minimization problems like Adam talked about yesterday, uh, and, and things like sort of PCA. So, so I'll talk about this sort of problem of the mean as kind of a focal point for lower bounds in differential privacy. There are sort of a lot of problems where kind of a tight lower bound kind of follows once you have a tight lower bound for releasing the mean. Um, and one more sort of comment, so I was sort of scheduled to give two talks on sort of different aspects of this work, and so I've basically kind of combined them into one, one talk, uh, but you know, we'll sort of take a break roughly between kind of tracing attacks and robust tracing attacks, or depending on how fast I go, we'll sort of take a break somewhere around 11.30, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'm still having a little trouble like advancing slides. There we go. Okay, so, so what I want to do, you know, so, so far sort of very abstract, but uh, what I want to do is I want to start with sort of a very basic example of kind of the mechanics of a tracing attack, and one where I can really like go through the analysis like pretty much, you know, start to finish, and I hope it sort of sinks in, and hopefully that will make this sort of idea of how you formalize like membership inference and kind of analytically like how membership inference can work um, you know, somewhat easier to understand. Uh, and then after that, you know, I'll talk about sort of uh, attacks on sort of different types of problems, sort of non-numeric problems like variable selection. And then, you know, probably after a break, we'll talk about so these robust tracing attacks and how they give these kind of tight lower bounds for privacy. Okay. And of course, as always, please stop me for questions sort of at will. Okay. So, we're looking at a very simple model. So for now, this is sort of like, you know, these are sort of like three guys that are gonna keep coming up in this talk like repeatedly. So the first character is of course a data set. So you have kind of a short, fat data set. So your data set is like an N by D matrix. Um, for this talk, it's useful to think of the entries as plus minus one. I know we've like mostly not been doing that, but it just makes life easier. Uh, but, but yeah, so you have you know, an n by d matrix where each row is a person and each person has given you kind of d bits of information. And of course, the first thing you'd like to do is you'd like to compute the mean of this data set. It's sort of like just about the most obvious thing to do with the data set. And, uh, and of course, you, know, you may, in order to achieve privacy, want to give some sort of noisy version of the mean of the data set, perhaps by adding, you know, Laplace noise that's been somehow like calibrated to N and D and epsilon in an appropriate way. Although for the first half of the talk, we're really just gonna focus on what happens if you just release the mean and you don't even attempt to achieve privacy. Okay, so the kind of two questions we wanna understand are like, you know, what are the risks of releasing the mean and kind of how much noise do we have to add to ensure some meaningful notion of privacy. So ideally differential privacy, but sort of for this talk, the question is really like, how much do we have to add to sort of prevent these membership inference attacks? Okay, so. Yep. so. Okay, so these are sort of like three things to keep in mind. I'm gonna like refer to like Q as the mean and Q hat as like a noisy mean several points in the talk and X is the data set. I'm also like at various points going to want to refer to like the rows of the data set as like X1 through Xn. So these are all things that uh, have come up in other talks, but, but they'll come up here a lot. 
Okay, so here's sort of like, you know, my like picture of what's going on in like a tracing or a membership inference attack. So, right, so if we want to like prove these things work, like we have to sort of model where the data came from. And like in Vitaly's talk, this came up a lot, that sort of the data set comes from some distribution and we need to somehow kind of like understand what that distribution looks like. Um, but of course, in empirical work, you don't have to like explicitly model it. But in our talk, we, we need to explicitly model the idea that the data set comes from some probability distribution. Otherwise, like it's sort of not going to be like meaningful to infer membership in the data set uh, versus membership out of the data set. So there's going to be this distribution P, which is you know a distribution over rows of the data set, and you know, like like in general, you can sort of talk about P being in some class of distributions, maybe you know. Like you can sort of incorporate whatever sort of prior information about the problem you have into P, but uh, a useful example to keep in mind is you know product distributions P. So each attribute is independent, but perhaps has a different and unknown mean. And in fact, in many of the results, sort of the easiest case to think about is just P is the uniform distribution. You know, sometimes we'll need P to be something else, but like you know, for example, P can be the uniform distribution or a product distribution. But when we, you know, in general, in the model, there's going to be some like class of distributions we think P might be. And since we're often going to think about a product distribution, sort of an important thing to keep in mind is, is this sort of population mean P, which is just, you know, your, like is just the average of a row from P. So for example, for uniform, this would just be like a big vector of zeros. But for, for other distributions, it might be something else. And now, of course, we're going to assume that our data set is sampled like IID from, whoa, IID from this distribution. Um, this is going to be essential, so the rows are not correlated. And so you would expect that if you draw enough samples, the mean Q is going to be kind of very close to P. Okay, so like learning Q and learning P are going to be kind of the same thing, or at least from the standpoint of utility, although as we'll see, it's sort of very different from the perspective of privacy. All right. Now, what's the goal? So like we have this attacker, and we're gonna assume the attacker, like the attacker gets the mean. Like the attacker has this noisy mean. Make maybe the real mean, maybe a noisy mean. This is what the attacker sees. Like this is what you've published into the world. And we're also gonna assume for now, we'll go back to this later, that the attacker also knows the distribution. Okay, so this is like a well-informed attacker. Like the attacker actually knows where the data comes from. So, you know, the attacker, like in some sense, you could say doesn't really have anything to learn about the like data set. Like he doesn't care. He sort of already knows the distribution. What the attacker is trying to learn is just like, are you in the data set, right? That's the goal. This is like a maliciously motivated attacker. They have no reason to like look at this information except to do membership inference. Okay, but we'll talk later about like whether that's really necessary. Right, now, the attacker has some target. Okay, so there's some target individual T. This, this thing. This is the target of the attack. And the attacker's goal is to figure out whether T is in or out of the data set. And like in isolation, that's like not a well-defined question, right? Like, you know, T can be sort of like an arbitrary vector. It's not clear, like, I mean, it's not, you know, we're not talking about whether it sort of matches some row of the data set. But what we're going to assume is that sort of one of two things is true. T is either, like this blue case, T is like out of the data set, which, by which I mean is just a random and like independent sample from the population. So, you know, T is just some person who didn't happen to be in the study, but could have been in the study. And the other case is that T is like a random or perhaps arbitrary element of the data set. Okay, so you know this is sort of like a like a pack learning model of membership inference. If you remember sort of Kobe's definition of pack learning, you can sort of think of T as like an example. Like I see a person, and that person has some true label, like they're in or out of the data set, and I am trying to learn to predict whether that person is in or out of the data set. Okay, and I'm I'm gonna use this like in out color coded terminology a lot just to like, it's you know, much easier than giving a long form explanation of like T as a random sample from P. Okay, so the goal of the attacker is to get, you know, a random individual from one of these two distributions and predict 
or correctly classify them as in or out of the data set. All right. Um, you know, so importantly, this is like a little bit different from something like a reconstruction attack, where sort of in and out of the data set is kind of like a like a bright line kind of thing. Like this person is or is not in, in or out of the data set. Here we're really only talking about like two distributions. So if I give you an arbitrary individual, like I don't particularly care what the attacker does. I'm really only interested in their behavior on kind of random individuals. Okay, so this is sort of the setup clear. Okay, so let's let's like spend a little more time sort of you know putting this like back into the context of kind of membership inference and sort of like why this is bad, like sort of why is this like a model in which you know if like why would succeeding in this model of attack be like a problem for privacy? Because as we saw, it's it's actually a bit subtle, right? Like it's very easy to kind of end up with just a model inversion attack, which I think Vitaly very like persuasively argued should not be thought of as a privacy attack. So I, I want to like justify that this is really a model of like meaningful like bad membership inference. So okay, so like the first I mean the first thing we should sort of like convince ourselves of is just that like membership in the data set can be sensitive information, right? Like usually when you talk about privacy breaches, you're talking about like learning someone's data. Here we kind of have your data, right? Like I get the target individual's data. So all, the, the only thing like kind of remaining to learn about this target individual is whether they're in the data set. But of course, you know, whether they're in the data set might in fact be like data on its own. So, so for example, in the, the Homer et al. paper, uh, you know, membership in the data set really is kind of a proxy for membership in one of two data sets. And one of those data sets is what's called the case group. This is like a set of sick individuals whose genomes you want to study. And the other data set is this control group of uh, sort of healthy individuals. And of course, you're going to use that to sort of calibrate, you know, to identify sort of which genes are kind of, you know, more common in the sick population. And so, you know, in the attack, you get, right, you get the target individual and you get the mean of the case group. But, you know, like if you believe that these two groups are just drawn from the same distribution, which, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, if you believe that these two groups are drawn from the same distribution, then if the target individual is a random member of the control group, they're like they're no different than a random member of the population from your perspective, right? They're just like you know we could just cut out, like we could just sort of cut out these arrows and like have the population go straight to you. So determining membership in the data set can really mean determining membership in like one of two data sets, and that can be very sensitive. Um, Okay, but now sort of really like why, you know, what, what's really key here is the fact that I'm assuming that sort of both data sets or that people who are in and out of the data set come from the same probability distribution. Okay, so if you don't make that assumption, it's very easy to end up with something like model inversion. But at the very least, it's just very easy to make the problem too hard or too easy. So, right, and sort of the, the model inversion picture looks kind of like this, where you know, I have sort of two data sets, or I have people who are in and out, and the distribution of people who are in, let's say, the case group is very different from the distribution of people in the control group, right? So I have really like two different probability distributions. And now, you know, if I know the two probability distributions, or if I've somehow learned the two probability distributions from the outcome of the study, then you know, I can sort of tell whether the target individual is in one of these two groups without even really seeing like, anything about the two data sets, right? I mean, I just, you know, the data sets are kind of just a figment. Really all I'm doing is I'm attributing this target individual to one of two populations. So if the two populations are far apart, this is kind of easy to do and it, it's not really a privacy breach. And of course, you know, one thing I would say is that it's, it's not really like, neither of these models is sort of exactly right. I mean. The idea that sort of people in and out of the data set are completely the same, you know, it's sort of subject to like a little bit of the same like, you know, problem like, like uh, circularity of model inversion, which is like if I believe that the people in the data set are exactly the same as the people out of the data set, like the data set's kind of, you know, probably I've declared my study a failure and I've never published anything about my data set. So, 
you know, the real answer is somewhere in the middle, but of course, like, if we want to sort of prove lower bounds in privacy, we need to set up the problem in such a way that inferring membership in the data set is like a clear privacy breach. Um, but I, I sort of don't want to apply that this model is kind of like fundamentally like the realistic model. I want to claim that it's sort of fundamentally the right model for like privacy attack like analysis. Uh, or maybe that it's at least a good model. And, and so I think there's actually a lot of questions about sort of, you know, what is a reasonable way to, to model these attacks. Okay, so good. So tracing is not model inversion. And then the, the last fact, which, you know, it, this is like just worth convincing yourself because it, it is like ever so slightly more, more subtle than you may think, is that you should convince yourself that like in this model, like a tracing attack violates differential privacy. So it's worth kind of like working through this actually as a way of making sure that you like kind of understand the definition and like what parameters of epsilon and delta are meaningful. So I'll sort of just leave that as an exercise, but like I just want to state it so it's kind of out there that of course, you know, if you can perform a tracing attack, then, then uh, the algorithm that gave you the statistics is not a differentially private one. Okay, so let's actually like talk about a tracing attack. Like let's, let's you know, say something about these attacks. Um, so I'm gonna focus for a while on sort of the case of like exact statistics. I'm not gonna talk about you know, noise and like how much noise you need to add to achieve differential privacy. I'm not gonna talk about differential privacy uh, at all at this point. So I'm gonna just simplify the model a little bit. I'm gonna assume that you actually get the mean, like the attacker gets the mean of the data set. And in this model, uh, I claim that there is a membership inference attack is possible as long as the dimension is big enough. So throw out some guesses, like how, how big does D have to be for a membership attack to be possible? Not Adam. Like, how's D equals three sound? Is it gonna work? Guess something. N. N. Okay, guesses like anyone else have like another guess? I'm gonna guess like D equals four. I forgot what's on the slide. I'll be surprised. Okay, so like Just like, hey, sort of, it's un uh, you can come up with sort of lots of guesses for how like fat this matrix has to be. Well, yeah, so I mean, I'm gonna present some facts, but you know, feel free to, <laughs> feel free to write some alternative facts in your notes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks fact checker. <laughs> yeah. It, Membership attacks are a hoax. Fake news. All right, so the answer, very astutely, is that if D is a bit bigger than N, then I can infer a membership. Yeah, right on. So, okay, so a theorem, which I'm sort of attributing to a pap this paper by Homer et al, who sort of like did this, and then a later paper by uh, Senkararaman et al, which sort of analyzed what happened in the Homer attack in this case where you get exact statistics. Um, although I'm sort of gonna give a proof that's very tailored to like extending to the case of noise. Um, it's a little different from theirs. So but the theorem is that basically if, if I give you the mean of a data set that is bigger than N, like a significantly bigger than N, then you will be able to distinguish a random member of the data set from a random member of the population. And this is not gonna hold for like arbitrary distributions. So let's just sort of like, right, you can sort of convince yourself that like you need some assumption on the distribution. So for example, suppose the distribution was supported on, you know, the all zeros vector or the, the all minus ones vector or the all plus ones vector. Like those are the only two types of people you, you can get and it's uniform between the two, right? So now, like, first of all, in the, when, when this happens, like, basically D is effectively one, like, there's only really sort of one dimension, and so, you know, when you see a person who is, 
all plus ones, let's say, well, you know, the data set is about half people who are all plus ones. Like, there's just nothing really different about the data set and the population. So this theorem is going to be true as long as the probability distribution is a product distribution. Okay, so it has to be a product distribution. And it also has to have some like significant like entropy. So similarly, like if, if the distribution has support size one, like it's just all plus ones, then it's a product distribution trivially, but of course there is no difference between people in the population and people in the data set. So we'll see when we get into the proof, like kind of, you know, like what actually is like needed to sort of make this work. But, so let me present the attack. So the attack is like a very simple form. The attack is just, you look at the released mean, and you look at the target, and you look at like a random member of the population. This is unfortunately a bit of a legacy note. But you can just think of this as you look at the population mean. So like, you have the population mean, like, oops. like you have the population mean P, you have the target T, and you have the released mean, which is Q or like Q hat, depending on whether it has noise or not. And you just ask basically like, does the target look more like the mean of the data set or the mean of the population? And like, notice something's a little like weird here, right? Like your goal in releasing the mean of the data set was to try to learn the mean of the population. So like if you had sort of done your job really well, like if you had sort of produced like perfect answers from a statistical perspective, which would be the mean of the population, it would be like no privacy risk. So this is like very much in the spirit of, of what Vitaly was talking about that like, you know, these privacy violations like are overfitting. Like they are the result of you like trying, sort of giving too much about your data set that really like wasn't interesting statistically in the first place. So I, I wanna, you know, drive that home. That's somehow not gonna be the case later on. Um, Okay, so now the attack, perhaps not surprisingly, since the title of the slide was already revealed, it just has the following like very simple form. So you get the target, you get the statistics, noisy or not, the mean, and you get this population mean. And when I say correlation, the correlation just means inner product in this case. Like it's not like the actual definition of correlation, but like it's a pretty good approximation. So you look at the correlation of the noisy marginals or possibly not noisy marginals, mean It's the result of using old slides. You look at the correlation of the target with the true mean, and you look at the correlation of the population mean and the, and the true mean. And you just ask, like, is it sort of statistically significant? Right, so like these things are gonna, this is not, this quantity is not gonna be zero just due to like randomness in the process, but you basically say, is there kind of a significant difference between the correlation of the target with the population and the correlation, or the correlation of the target with the release statistics and the correlation of the population mean with the release statistics? And if there is, you say this was probably a person who came from the data set, and if there's not, you say this was probably a person who's independent of the data set. Okay, so a very simple, like extremely simple, right? There's no deep learning oracle here. Like there's no fuzzy like neural net. This is like, a zero layer neural network with zero hidden layers and like zero back propagation steps and like, you know. These are like, by the way, these are like the kind of, like this is like the kind of deep learning we can analyze. Like, <laughs> like if you actually look at the theorems for that people prove about deep learning, like this is like what it is. <laughs> like, so I'm gonna call this like, you know, theoretical approaches to deep learning. Like, okay. So let me, before giving you a proof by like, proof, let me just give you like a proof by picture. Like let me sort of explain what's going on in this attack. Like this is gonna be sort of really like useful for, for perspective. So what I've done here is like I generated a uniformly random n by d data set and I computed its exact mean q. All right, so, so far something very simple. And now what I plotted is the distribution of the test statistic, which by the way, like p equals zero, so like this like, goes away. All right, so I plotted the distribution of the test statistic, t dot q, in the case where t is independent of the data set, and in the case where 
T is, in fact, a random member of the data set. So blue is independent, orange is random member of the data set. And what you'll notice is that these kind of look like, you know, Gaussians, like sort of, you know, if you took this picture out to infinity, like these two things would converge to like, you know, nice Gaussians. Okay, so then, you know, and of course in the real world, they're like combinatorial things, they're like binomial distributions, but you know, they kind of look like Gaussians, and we understand Gaussians. So, what, you're, what I'm gonna show in the proof is that basically, these Gaussians are D over N apart. Okay, so like as you know, D gets big relative to N, these Gaussians will be like getting you know, fairly well separated. And the width of the Gaussians, like the standard deviation of the Gaussians, is about square root D over N. Okay, and so when D over N is like significantly bigger than one, the gap between the two distributions is like significantly bigger than the standard deviation, which means that you know, if you get a random sample from blue or a random sample from orange, you're gonna have a pretty good chance of like distinguishing them. All right, and this is gonna be like sort of the whole game and like all these attacks. Like, like we're gonna try to sort of impose some picture like this on the world where like, you know, in the out case we get one distribution in the you know, some Gaussian-like distribution, and the in case we get some other Gaussian-like distribution, and we want to know both how far apart they are and like how like well spread they are. Okay, like we want to know sort of the signal to noise ratio. All right, so let's actually like try to prove some of this stuff. So first I want to prove that in the, if I use this attack with this threshold, which, uh, which we'll sort of see where it comes from later, then when I have a target that's independent of the data set, I have a very high probability of correctly labeling them as independent of the data set. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's see if I, can, if I can do proofs on the screen. So, okay, so remember, so by assumption, the target is independent of the data set. So like, what is its mean? Like what is, the expected value of the target in this case. Yeah? Ah! Yeah, it's just, I mean, not even the, I mean, just, just right, the, the it come, it's a random sample from the population, right, and it's independent of everything, so, uh, it's just p. It's just the mean of the population. All right, so now let's like fix the data set x, which of course also fixes the mean of the data set. It's just a deterministic function of x. So for fixed x and q, the expected value of t dot q is just pq, right? Like, not, not doing anything too magical here. Okay. And what that means is that the expected value of the test statistic is zero. By the way, like these are all vectors, like I can draw them in bold on the slides, but not with my hand. So, good, so the mean of the test statistic is zero. So like, if you go back to the chart, which I don't want to, because I think it's gonna erase what I wrote, um, right, that's like we're establishing that that blue plot is like centered at zero. And now, like, what is, right, like what is the test statistic? It's the sum overall, ah, Oh, well, we learned that if I go backwards, it doesn't erase the writing. Uh, we learned that it is, right, it's the sum over all columns of the target tj times qj. And by assumption, since q is fixed, this is a sum of independent, 
random variables. So this is where we use the fact that this is a product distribution, right? This is very concentrated around its mean. But how concentrated? So it's a sum of independent random variables, and the tj's are plus minus one. But the qj's are actually smaller. So like I drew data kind of uniformly. Um, So, sorry. so these are independent random variables, and the QJs are typically quite small. So I claim that typically QJ is in could be your pen tip is like falling off this thing. Like, it's a little weird. Okay, so I claim that typically like the QJs, at least in the case where the data is uniform, uh, are between uh, plus minus one over root n. Okay, so if Q is not uniform, they'll be like around their mean by this amount. But the point is that the QJs are like in a very tight range. Okay, and this just follows by the fact that the data set is drawn IID from some distribution, so the mean of the data set concentrates very well around the population mean. So if we apply a Hofting bound, we get that the probability that this test statistic is bigger than something that's sort of square root of the number of variables times the range of those variables times square root log one over delta with probability bigger than one minus delta. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is basically just like the standard, you know, churn off bound. We're just using this like extra fact that we're summing random variables that tend to be living in a range of about like one over root d, or one over root n. Okay, so like it's sort of obvious that we're summing random variables that live between zero and one, or minus one and one, but, but we're actually summing random variables in like a much narrower range. Okay, good. So we've kind of established that in the out case we get like a you know, Gaussian-ish distribution, or at least a distribution with sort of Gaussian-like tails with standard deviation about root d over n uh, and mean zero. Okay, but now let's look at like why in the case of a, sort of like why in the case of uh, why in the case where the target is in the data set do we actually get like a significant um, uh, Yes, I did. Yes, thank you. Okay, so, so why, you know, why when the target comes from the data set would we get anything different? And the reason is, of course, that like, the target is sort of a little bit correlated with the mean, right? So in the previous case, we said the target is like independent of the mean. In this case, the target is like a little bit correlated with the mean, right? Like if the target has a plus one in a given coordinate, the mean of the distribution, uh, or the, the, like the mean of the data set in that coordinate is like slightly likely to be higher than, than lower. So, and, and that's sort of what we're going to exploit. So let's for now like just consider the case where the mean of the data set is actually zero, so completely uniform data. And let's just like observe two facts. So the inner product of a row of the data set with itself is like mean d. In fact, it's always d. It's just like a sum of d like square, you know, d squared random variables, and so they're, they're always one, so D. However, if I take two like different rows of the data set, the mean is zero. So if I take two different rows of the data set, the mean is zero, because these are just like independent uniform strings, uh, so they're uncorrelated. <coughs> 
So now if we look at the expectation of someone in the data set xi with q, the mean, that is uh, the expectation of this, the average overall j of the inner product of xi and xj, okay, because q is itself just the average of the xj's. And so this is now d over n, where the d over n comes from this term plus n minus 1 over n times 0. And so one of the rows of the data set is in fact the same as the target, the others are independent. So there's kind of this one row where I'm going to get a contribution of d and the rest of the rows are going to give me a contribution of 0 in expectation. All right, but now like we can just sort of use the same Hofding argument. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like t is like, I'm just going to label t as xi because in this case, and, and notice also like this holds for every xi in the data set. Like there's no random person in the data set here. Um, this is going to hold like for every. Uh, for every i. Okay, so once again we can apply concentration and use the same argument as before to say that in this case, the correlation uh, T and Q, the probability that it's at least its expectation D over N, oh my god, minus the same, the same term, this is just the threshold, is at least one minus delta. All right, and so now, you know, the important thing, of course, is that we need this quantity, d minus, d over n minus t, to be bigger than t. Okay, so we just need to set uh, d over n to be bigger than two times the threshold, and, you know, solving, like, uh, right, so d over n bigger than 2t turns out to be true as long as d is bigger than n log one over delta. This time I was done with the slide, but I still didn't want to click. Okay, cool. So now that, that's the analysis for the uniform case. Nothing really changes so much in the case where you have an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary p, except that now we still have that the expected inner product of xi with itself is d. Uh, but now if we take two random variables, or two random rows that are independent, xi and xj, their expected inner product is actually p squared times d. And if you work it out, what this gives us is that the expected value of t minus p dot q is equal to kind of d over n, n minus 1 over n p squared d minus p squared d. That's sort of why we have to correct by the population. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, yeah, so I'm assuming that uh, I should say p, uh, like p k, like, let's just assume that like p is a unif, sorry, this is very confusing. Yes, yeah, so let's just assume that p is like the vector, like, you know, with the same entry. Of course, like it's not actually crucial that it's the same entry, it's just a slightly more complicated calculation if you actually have a different, you know, value of the, the population mean in each entry. I'm sorry, that was very confusing. Okay, but the point is once we do this correction by the population mean, we actually get the same property that the expected value of the test statistic becomes d over n. And, you know, sort of like what, what's, what's going on here is that the population mean is the sort of important like 
calibrating information. Like somehow, right, like if the mean is very biased, then you would sort of expect the target to look like the, uh, you would sort of expect the target to look like the data set because, you know, if the, if the mean of the data set is plus one, if everyone has the same row, you would sort of expect the target to look like the data set. So what's actually going on is that there's this like correction factor here of one minus p squared. So like as long as p is bounded away from minus one and plus one, the mean of this data set is far apart from, is far from zero. If you have like very skewed data, there's just no difference between people in and out of the data and so you, you can't get a separation. So like the two Gaussians get like closer together. Okay, so this is, this is basically the entire analysis of this tracing attack. You now know something about deep learning uh, in some cases where we can say theoretical things about deep learning. Yeah, so right, great. So a pro right, the assumption that it's a product distribution is a fairly strong assumption. So we can like go back to the statement. So the assumption that it's a product distribution is a fairly strong assumption. And this is like a sim we're in like a similar situation to what I said about kind of the difference between like model inversion and like this model where like you need something to be true about P. Right? Like if P is not a product distribution, then D is like effectively, can be effectively one. Like you can say, you know, fine, I get as many columns as I want, but like they're all the same. I don't get any useful information. So clearly you need something. Um, and you know, clearly a product distribution is not realistic, right? Like and the whole point of anal, I mean, it's sort of, why are you analyzing these data sets? Like you're, surely there's something correlated. Yeah, so that's right, so, so exactly. So like it's, one thing that I like about this, this attack, and I'm gonna sort of like make this a little more explicit later on, is that it somehow like feels very robust to like model misspecification. So for example, you know, suppose this was a product distribution, but like one column was equal to another column. You know, it's it, like somehow the attack doesn't just like die. Like you can sort of show like it'll shift the mean in one case by a little bit, like it'll, Right, like it'll, it'll it'll have like some you know smooth effect. <laughs> yeah, so right, exactly. So you know, in some sense, the only place we used independence was so that we could apply a uh, like a Hofting bound, right? So you can certainly say that like in any setting where like the Hofting bound holds, which is, you know, again like in the real world, like nothing is independent, but somehow like Hofting bounds still have like predictive value when statisticians apply them to sampling problems. So I, you know, I. I not making any sort of formal claim. In fact, I think this is like a very interesting direction to try to understand like really like completely when these work. But I do like, you know, I want to claim this is like a, a stylized but not like on its face ridiculous assumption, right? Like if, if the data is somehow completely correlated and there are in fact, there are in fact like works um, on things like, you know, if you assume that the data, uh, you know, for instance, there's some low dimensional subspace, like there's, K independent columns and the rest of the columns are some like linear combination, can you recover that information? And the answer is basically like, in some settings, yes, you, you can use that to get like a more useful private mechanism, but you have to be careful. Like, you know, it's not that the attack just fails, it's that there exists a better differentially private algorithm. So I, th I think these questions of exactly like what assumptions make the attack work with what parameters are, are very like open and interesting. Okay, so we're, we're running sort of the end of like the first half of the talk. So I wanna just say a little bit about like a setting where we can analyze a similar attack that doesn't involve like numeric data. So instead of the mean, when you're releasing sort of like a, you know, discrete like uh, property of the data set. Uh, oh, sorry, first I wanna talk about applications to other problems, I lied. Okay, so the mean is like very simple. It's like the first thing, you know, we talk about like you want to answer D queries. Um, but I want to say like this mean is sort of like a special case of many problems. So in many cases, it, you know, it'll give you some tracing attack that works for like different types of data. And also in many cases, lower bounds for the mean will sort of turn out to give you like optimal lower bounds for other problems. So one example is this convex uh, risk minimization problem Adam talked about. So if, if you remember, the model is that 
each kind of row of the data set is like some convex function on some parameter theta uh, that lives in RD. So like, you know, the first row of the data set can be this, you know, theta squared minus two theta plus one. The second row can be theta squared plus one. Right? And now there's some average convex function or a sum of convex functions. I wrote the average, which for this data set is theta squared plus one. And your goal is to find like a minimizer of like the average functions. You've got this L bar and you want to find the theta that minimizes L bar. And it's like not very hard to cook up examples where the minimizer of this function is just the mean of the data set. So for example, if uh, the parameter space theta, uh, theta is, is vectors uh, of length d, then you can come up with, you know, take your data set with rows x1 through xn and come up with convex functions that ask for the squared Euclidean norm between theta and xi. And it's, you know, simple calculus exercise to show that the minimizer of this function uh, is just uh, the mean of the data set. So, you know, if you're releasing the mean of a like, nice convex function, if you're releasing the minimizer of nice convex functions, you can still be subject to tracing attacks. Uh, and in fact, basically the same tracing attack in this case. Uh, and there's lots of different ways to kind of embed the mean into different convex optimization problems. Another uh, function is to optimize the the inner product of theta with the average row, and uh, the mean, the, here the minimizer would be the normalized, the normalized mean. And another example that's a little trickier would be something like PCA. So here you view your data as like an n by d matrix, and you want to preserve privacy of like the rows of the matrix, the same way you would uh, for a data set. And you know, now you know, what is the top principal component of, of the data set? It is the, vec the unit vector v on the right that maximizes the norm of x times v. And that's, of course, you know, it's a very interesting problem for data analysis. That's typically like a, it's like a very common problem to want to solve. And in this case, like the, the top singular vector is not the mean, but you can sort of show that if there are like very biased columns of the data set, then the top singular vector will put a lot of weight on those columns and that will, um, uh, that will be sort of enough to make the attack work. So there's a, a nice paper by uh, Dwork, Talwar, Thakocha, and, and Zhang from four, 2014 that sort of worked out lower bounds for PCA using similar techniques to, to the mean. Okay, so just wanted to make the point that this sort of extends in an almost immediate way to many other problems. So tracing the mean is kind of fundamental because it's sort of like immediately gives you attacks on lots of problems. So let me just say a few words about selecting variables, which is an example of like a discrete problem where we can actually say something uh, along these lines. So here, you know, again, like you have the mean, and you'd say, look, the mean is very high dimensional, and I now know that like if d is bigger than n, I can't release the mean without suffering this tracing attack. So, you know, I'm all bummed, but one thing to notice is that you know, like, why were you releasing the mean of this data set? So one reason you might have been releasing the mean of this data set is because you wanted to like find some interesting columns in the data set. And maybe like a reasonable definition of interesting would be like these columns where the mean is like plus one. They're like very biased columns, All right? These might be, you know, the genes that are very common in a population of sick individuals. So maybe what you want is not the mean, but you want some like sort of, you know, lower dimensional object, you just want to know like which are the interesting columns, right? And I'm, you know, maybe you just want to know which are the interesting columns and once you know the interesting columns, you can throw away everything else and you can, you know, release just the mean on those and now you're, now you're happy. So like for this data set, the most interesting columns are one and three. You may also be happy with some kind of noisy selection of columns where, um, you know, sort of the top columns of some noisy version of the mean. And so you can ask, like, what is it, you know, what is, like, telling me the top columns, like, do? Like, you know, what is the harm in telling me which are the large columns in my data set? And, you know, how much noise would I have to add to, like, protect the top columns? So the first observation is that if I tell you, like, just the means of, like, the k largest columns, that somehow can't be any, like, 
better than telling you the means of like k fixed columns, right? So sort of if all the columns are the same and I, Adam is correctly like a little skeptical and I'm, I'm glossing over something, but uh, you know, one can show for example like if the data is uniform, like if I run the attack on the top k columns, it can't be worse than running the attack on like, or it can't be better than running the attack on the first k columns. So you can sort of immediately like conclude that releasing the top k columns is no easier than releasing the mean of k columns for which we already have this attack. However, if you actually like run this attack, you'll notice that like somehow d matters. So like even though you're only releasing k independent of d columns, somehow the attack starts to work like way better when you've selected those columns from a set of d columns for like bigger and bigger d. So like you can see like here at, like in the top left, this is like you have a data set of size 100 and the dimension of the data set is 200 and you run the attack on the like top 200 columns, which are just all the columns, and it's not very good, but if you like selected those columns from a larger data set, suddenly this attack works really well. And like you can in fact show that this is like inherent. You can show that basically uh, this attack will succeed not only when k is bigger than n, like not only when you're releasing the means of more columns than there are rows in the data set, but in fact, you really only need something like k log d has to be bigger than n, right? So the point is this like log d versus constant. Um, and so this is both an example of how you can run the attack on like discrete outputs, but also how you can, um, how you can in fact show that the selection effect is really important. So somehow the bottleneck in finding the interesting columns is not releasing the means of those columns, it's like finding them. Like there's sort of more, it's a harder privacy problem to identify which columns are large than it is to actually release their mean once you know what they are. So I think that's like an interesting uh, phenomenon because you know, uh, you can sort of imagine someone coming up to you and saying like, well, we ensure privacy by releasing very few statistics. You know, all we released are these like 100 statistics. And you say, yeah, but like where did those 100 statistics come from? And it turns out like it matters where they come from. Okay, and uh, I'm sort of running out of time for the first half, so I'll just sort of flash the attack. It's just the inner product attack, except in order to make it work without even knowing the mean of the columns, you have to be a little careful what inner product you're taking. So the attack is you take the correlation of the target with the indicator vector for the set. So this is like, you know, a sparse vector that says, uh, you know, it has a one if you've selected that column and a zero if you haven't selected that column. Okay, and I'm, I think I'm gonna I think this is a good time to take a break. I'm not gonna like say anything about the analysis of the attack. Uh, I just sort of want to make the point that selection is important and also that like you can sort of port these ideas to like non-numeric outputs. So let me put up the outline and, and we can take a coffee break. I think it's been a, at least an hour if not more and we'll come back and I'll talk about what to do when there's noise in your answers. <laughs>